there's so much power in praise. So come on, let's lift our praises up to the Lord this morning and prepare our hearts for worship.
You're the same God, still working, still moving, still providing. Yeah, this is who you are. And those who know your name, they can trust you. beautiful lyric for us to recite over and over and over again that he is the same God today that he was for folks over the course of thousands of generations would you pray with me Lord Jesus we just honor you right now that through your example and through your love we get to experience and understand just a glimpse into the fullness of who you are as we open our hearts today, would you let us receive the good news that comes from your message? And would you change our hearts and our lives here forever? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great to be with you all this morning. You guys sound great. As you find your seat, go ahead and say hello to somebody around you. Ten a.m. service. It's great to be with you guys. How y'all feeling out there? All right, that's good. We got three of you that are excited to be at church today. I'm grateful for that. Maybe I set that up improperly. How y'all doing today? Okay, that was better. That was good. There's at least ten of you now. Hey, warm welcome to everybody joining us online. We're glad that you're with us. My name is Stephen. If we haven't met, I'm the campus pastor here of our North San Jose location. With me, I got my good friend Tanya who's over a lot of things here. What's up, Tanya? Good morning, everyone. Hey, we are in week three of our series called Wonderfully Made, where we are exploring the topic of gender, sexuality, identity, desire, and more. That's exciting stuff that we get to talk about, but we really want to make sure that at any time during our service, you have all of the resources or the answers to the questions that you may have right at your disposal. And the best way to do that is by accessing our digital program. So if you would, go ahead and pull out your smartphone devices and scan the QR code that's up on the screen or on the back of the chair in front of you. Those of you online, you can head to echo.church slash connect and all of those resources will be right there for you. Yes, and if you are a first time guest, please let us know because we just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. It is hard being a first timer anywhere, especially a church, especially a church talking about some pretty amazing things with Wonderfully Made. So if you're a first time guest, after the message, please, in, in the digital program, there's a box that says check in. And within there, there's a there's another box that says I'm a first time guest. And once you do that, it indicates that we can then love on you and send you a digital gift card. That's part of my job. I get to bless first time guests. And then the other thing is uh, come out to the hub after service, the big red wall. And 
um, meet us in person, and then we can put a physical gift in your hand, another way of saying thank you for being our first time guest. We are so glad that you're here with us. Yeah, that's awesome. We would love the opportunity to just meet you and say hello before you leave. Hey, another thing that we want to draw your attention to is that during this series, we've been gathering on Sunday to have these really important conversations, but we have also made sure that we would have additional opportunities to come together as a community to dive in, and one of those events was hosted a few weeks ago with author David Bennett. It was really powerful, but our next event is actually coming up this coming Friday right here at North San Jose called TikTok Theology. Pastor Dan Kimball will come and he will share the narrative that is being pushed out on these identity statements or sexuality through TikTok and he will then compare the reality of what we see in the Bible as an opportunity for us all to see what's going on in culture. And then just a few weeks after that, we get to hear from one of the leading voices in this topic. His name is Preston Sprinkle and there's two specific events for that. The first one is on Tuesday, May 7th up at Menlo Church where we get to gather together Together as everyone from these churches to dive into these topics and then the next day on Wednesday May 8th there's a specific event designed just for teens those students over at Westgate Church and we're sending all of our echo students from all of our campuses there to engage in a really important conversation we would love for you to join us at all of those and you can RSVP for every event right there on your digital program Yes, and now it's time in our service to transition to the message. And we are in week three of Wonderfully Made, and Pastor Felipe has an amazing message prepared for us on longing, desire, and singleness. And I hope you all wore your waterproof mascara, those ladies, because just be ready to receive a powerful word. And um, give Pastor Felipe a big warm welcome after this video. Church, welcome everybody. Welcome all of our campuses today, wherever you find yourself uh, in uh, here at Echo. We're so glad you made it. You made it to church. We're in a cool, really cool series called Wonderfully Made. This is week number three. So we started this journey by talking about how God uh, designed our bodies to matter. He values our bodies and it matters to him. We also spent last week talking about our sexuality and the significance and meaning of marriage and sex and all the things that come from that. Next week we're talking about gender, but today we're going to take a deep dive into the topics of singleness, longing, and even the life of uh, desire and all that stuff that comes from that. But every week we've been reminding everyone here in our community of some ground rules that just help us stay unified, even though we're a very diverse community with lots of different opinions. So ground rules are really simple. Number one is we're just agreeing on this. We don't have to agree to show respect and love. So in our community, if you come here with a purpose to cause disunity and hatred, this is not the right place for you. We just believe there's a way to walk in unity even when we don't agree. Number two is we're a community center on Jesus. So what we do is we give you our very best understanding of the Bible. We're not here to debate and to argue. We're here to learn to love and walk like Jesus. And number three, we're here to create bridges, not to build walls. We believe all people are valued before God. We're all broken. We all need grace. We all need forgiveness. And no matter who you are here with us today, gay, straight, confident, not confident, uh, have all kinds of desires or attractions, made mistakes or think you're really good at not making mistakes. It doesn't matter. You are deeply loved here in this community. We believe God loves you. We love you. And we're so glad that you're here to join us today. In fact, can we commit this space and time to God before we take a deep dive into his word? Father, thank you that you're here Thank you that you care for every individual to the sound of my voice, that you deeply love us. And I pray today, God, that we would experience the depth of that love even more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you thought before 
where your cravings come from? Like, what are some of the longings and desires that you have for yourself? Like, some people long to have a better body, so they work out all the time. Some people, they long to have better friends or to have romance or to make sure not to die before they have sex, whatever it is your desire is. Some people actually long for human, you know, uh, physical pleasure. Some people long for adrenaline rushes. Sometimes our longing is for control, success, and, and all these things that come from achievement. Where does that come from for us? You know, I've been married for 21 years, and I shared this recently, uh, that I love my wife. I'm faithful to my wife. She is like the love of my life. She's my everything. But it's very interesting to me how I have so many desires still inside of me that I have to control even though I love my wife. I find other women attractive, not just my wife. And your husband, wives, finds other women attractive, not just you. And so forth, vice versa, to all of us. Because there are attractions, desires, and longings inside of us that are not meant to be pursued and some that are. Though even, so even though I love my wife, I have to consistently submit every desire or longing or everything that I've ever felt or, or experienced for another woman to God so that I don't act on those desires so that I can stay faithful to my wife. And I avoid situations that put me in temptation that to betray that faithfulness to my wife because I know I'm a broken human being and if I follow every desire and longing and attraction I have, it'll destroy my marriage. I've also shared with you how I've struggled in the past with other addictions, especially in my younger years with pornography, drinking, lying, smoking, all these things that all came from an inability or unwillingness to control desire. When you let your desires loose, they do not bring us good things. In fact, what we call that is an addiction. An addiction is a result of uncontrolled desires that we have. And it might come in the form of gambling, in the form of sex, in the form of social media, performance, whatever it might be. So the question that remains is, where does this come from? Is it from God? What is it? Like, where does this come from? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about this, and I want to show you today how contrary to common belief, true freedom is actually not achieved by pursuing every desire, but instead by submitting them to God. And we're going to dive into a book of the Bible called Galatians that is one of the boldest letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to early century churches, and it's very powerful, and what he's trying to do is explain to them what freedom is all about. They were wrestling with this idea of what it looks like to live in freedom. So if you have a Bible, you want to open it there. If you don't, it's okay. It's on the screens. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 today. Now, he goes like this. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. This Little phrase, satisfy your sinful nature. Literally, if you translate it literally from the Greek, it's original language. It means do not indulge your flesh. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. What he's saying is, God did design us for freedom. And I love it that he starts that way. Like, you've been called, people, to a life of freedom. Like, God is not trying to kill your joy but freedom does not come by what he calls indulging the flesh. In fact, by doing that, you find yourself back in bondage. The flesh is this word in the Bible that's used to descri describe what we call our sinful nature. Paul begins to tell us here the difference between two forces in our life. One force is the sinful nature of the flesh, and the other force or the influence in our life is the Spirit of God. And we have to choose if we're going to obey this one or obey this one. And you might wonder, why does that even exist? Like, why is there even a battle inside of us? Well, when God created humans and he put the first humans in that garden experience, he created us to be made complete through our union with him. He wanted to be close to humanity he created us to be fulfilled in our intimacy with him. 
but he didn't want that relationship to be a forced relationship. And for it to be not a forced relationship, humans had to have a choice to choose either God and all the things that come from that flourishing relationship with God or choose to try to fulfill their desires through something else. So the symbol of that choice in the first creation narrative was a tree. So God put one tree in the midst of many and he says, you have a choice. You can choose all that I give to you or you can choose the tree. And I want to show you why they ended up choosing this tree that led to our sinful nature when the enemy came to tempt them. Notice this. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and notice, pleasing to the eye and desirable. It was good, it was pleasing to the eye and desirable. So then she took it, she ate it, she passed it to her husband, And he ate it too. Notice the strategy the enemy used even in that first garden experience. He convinced them that because it felt good and it looked good and their bodies longed for it, that it must be good for them. It's the same strategy he's been using ever since. I love how a church leader in the 1500s famously said this. He said it like this. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. See, this is what was happening then, and it still happens today. It feels good. I want it. I think it's okay. It feels good. I kind of want it. I'll justify it. I don't think God really said that. I'll just do it. Anyways, so sin came into our existence during that garden experience, and now it's in our nature, which means that we're all born with propensities and longings and desires that were not meant to be a part of the human existence. We were meant to be fulfilled in all of our desires in our intimate relationship with God, but because of our sinful nature, we've had that distorted inside of us, and we no longer get to experience that which we were created for in its original way. Now there's a battle going on inside of us because of this nature. So Paul shows us the path back to freedom. And he says in Galatians 5.16, so I say, in light of this, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Again, in the literal translation, it it would say, walk habitually by the Spirit. Like walk in step with the Spirit of God. Then You won't be doing what your sinful nature, that's the flesh, craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us, notice, desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires. This is why sometimes we feel like there's a war happening inside of us because what the Spirit wants is not what the flesh wants. In fact, the flesh desires, wants, and craves that which is opposite from the Spirit of God. So Paul even says, this means good intentions are not going to be good enough. These two forces, he says, are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out good intentions. So like when people say to you, follow your heart, it's actually not very good advice. Because your heart will lead you to deceptive places. So then Paul helps us see the result of each of these leanings. First he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. It's sexual morality, impurity, lustful pleasure, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, a huge list of things. And then he says, let me tell you again, as I've told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's very bold language. So this idea of like following the desire of the flesh is following the path of least resistance. If you just let it go and don't control, you'll find yourself into places that will not truly fulfill you. And I think it's really interesting that the first four sins on that list of many sins are all related to sexuality. 
sexual morality, adultery, impurity, lustful thoughts and pleasures. It's things that are contrary to the will of God. The words there mean that anything outside of the covenantal marriage of a man and a woman. He just unpacks them all. And in essence, what he's saying is that one of the greatest traps of the flesh is connected to our sexual longings. And it comes in various forms. And then he says this little phrase that I just want to bring clarity to. He says, anyone living that sort of life, which again, in a literal way, he's actually saying anyone practicing this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what this does not mean first. It does not mean that people that commit any of these sins or commit a sin will go to hell. It's not what he's trying to say in this context. It's that if you give in to these desires without submitting them to God, but instead, instead making them the practice of your life, you will miss out on all the things that come from being a part of the kingdom of God. See, when you come to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. Come into my life. I surrender myself to you. What happens is that he becomes the king of your life. And everything that belongs to the king belongs to those in the kingdom. And God wants to give you grace and blessing and joy and peace. And what the apostle Paul is saying is, if you make a decision to make these kinds of things the practice of your life without trying to surrender them to your king, you miss out on the gifts the king is trying to give to you. The kingdom life starts when you make Jesus your king. And he wants to give you freedom. He wants to do all of this that Paul's saying there. But he's saying, but don't don't misunderstand. You can't choose to follow that and still have the blessings of the kingdom. So then he shows us the results of following the Spirit. They're very different. He says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And then he says, there is no law against these things. Like you don't have to create boundaries to keep us from these things because these are the things every human desires to have. And what he's trying to say is there's a battle. There's a battle between your flesh and your spirit. And if you follow your flesh and the longings that you have inside of you that come from your sinful nature, this is the stuff that comes out of your life. When you feed the flesh, you get quarreling and disorderly you know, desires and attractions and sexual immorality. But when you follow the Spirit of God, He starts to produce inside of you Love and peace and gentleness and goodness and all these good things that come from his presence. And we all have this battle all the time between these two sides of us. It's been my whole life this way. I remember early in my marriage, my wife, uh, we had this day where I was being snappy and rude and angry and uh, impatient. And she looked at me and she said, you haven't spent time with Jesus lately, have you? I hadn't. And she could tell. You know why? Why? Because when I am in the presence of Jesus, I come out and I'm loving more, I'm forgiving, I'm kind. And when I'm not, you don't want to meet the Felipe on this side of the equation. (laughs) He is mean. Some of you wives, you're wondering, what happened to my husband as I came back from, as they came back from the men's retreat? He did the dishes, you know, he washed the carpet, he, he brought me flowers, he was kind and gentle. You know what happened? We just came back from being in the presence of Jesus together. And when you're in the presence of Jesus, he conditions your heart. And what comes out of you is all that stuff that the Spirit produces inside of you. You too have a version of you that without God is not good. See, we can control our desires or our desires begin to control us. If you feed the flesh, the flesh will come out in these manifestations that are not good. And if you pursue and follow the Spirit, what comes out of your life is the good stuff. When it comes to desires, there's three main options for us. Option number one, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down, is you indulge them. 
You, this is the people that say, well, I'm born with a desire, so they must be good. Let me lean into it. If it looks good and it feels good, it must be good. So follow your heart, follow your emotions. And that kind of perspective leads to addictions and insatiable desires because you're going to be pursuing something to fill a gap in your heart that will still feel empty at the end of it. Option number two is to ignore desire. It's what a lot of people do in the church. And it is a trap. It's when you say, I'm really not an alcoholic. Like, I don't, really don't have a problem with food. I really don't have an attraction. Like, I, I, I really don't have that. It's, I'm not really tempted here. And what happens with this is it leads to denial, self-righteousness, sometimes even hypocrisy. And it makes you actually fall into sin because you're repressing something that's not meant to be repressed. It's meant to be acknowledged and surrendered to God. You see, sometimes people ask me, why do you have all these like boundaries in your life? Is it because you think you're so holy? See, Christians ought to have boundaries in their life, not because they think they're holy, but because they know they're broken. Because I know I have disorderly desires that come from my flesh, I avoid situations that make me tempted to do the thing that I know my flesh wants to do. I have it in me. I'm really broken. So I protect myself, not because I'm holy, but because I know I am filthy and broken inside. I have a nature that will lead me to do things that are contrary to the will of God if I let it go loosely. So we can maybe indulge the flesh and lead to bad things or ignore it, which leads to bad things. But the third option, I believe, is the option Paul is calling us to. He says you can also surrender it. This is what Paul says is the path to freedom. He says those who belong to Christ Jesus, they have nailed, literally nailed, their passions and desires to the, and their, of their sinful nature to his cross, and they crucified them on that cross, which means I'm not ignoring it, I'm not repressing it, I'm not pretending they don't exist, I'm not indulging in it, I'm surrendering them. I am entrusting every desire and attraction that I have to one who is way more powerful than I, one who is able to give me the control to make sure that I pursue the things that lead to a flourishing life. Our ultimate desire is for God. See, you can't pursue this kind of life You can't do what he's saying until you realize that one truth. Ultimately, we are made complete. In fact, Colossians 2.10 says, You also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Trying to fill a gap that only Jesus can fill will leave you completely empty. You and I are made complete through our union with Jesus. If you're trying to change a bunch of behaviors, but you haven't yet taken a step toward the one that made you, that is able to give you strength beyond yourself, you will fall right back into those behaviors. The path to transformation leads you to a cross. It does not lead you to the inside of your own heart. Your heart will deceive you. This truth impacts every single person here with us today. Some of you, you have heterosexual relationships and some don't and some whatever it is, whatever, wherever you find yourself, this applies to you. Some of you are in a relationship right now and the reason you're constantly disappointed at your sp- spouse or your partner is because you're trying to have them fill a part of you that only God can fill. You're trying to have them complete you. And this idea that we use in culture, like you complete me, it sounds really cute. It's absolutely wrong. When you try to put that expectation on another human, they'll frustrate you. They're not meant to complete you. See, we need relationships for human flourishing. But if you think a romantic relationship will complete you, you will be left empty on the ground If you believe that, what happens is you hop from one relationship to the next, hoping that that something will change and thinking that the problem is in the other person, but the problem is that the other person is not God. 
and you're trying to expect them to do something that God only can do. For those of you that are single, maybe you struggle because you don't want to be single and you feel pressured to find like the one in your life and you think if I just find the one, I'm going to be complete. I want to make it clear like marriage, singleness can be received as a huge gift. Like some people are single for a season. Some are single because the God has called them to be single as a way of honoring him with their life and serving them with all their focus. And singleness is not a second-class status. It's a high calling that comes with incredible kingdom privileges and abilities that married people do not have. The scriptures elevate singleness many times above marriage itself. Jesus actually modeled this for us. There's an instance in Matthew 19 where he's talking about marriage and giving guidance on marriage. And the disciples, they, they, they kind of answered this conversation with a strange statement. They said, if this is true, like if this is the case, Jesus, it's better not to marry. And then Jesus responds to them. And he says, not everyone can accept this statement. Only those whom God helps. See, some are born as eunuchs, and eunuch is a word they use in that century to really describe those that couldn't have sex or that chose the single life or a life of celibacy in service to God. And so he says, some are born this way, others have been made this way by others, some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. He's like, if you, if you can receive this calling... Do it. Accepting the gift of singleness and celibacy, it, it might not be socially acceptable in our day, but it is one of the greatest gifts and most honorable callings the Bible gives to people. And if this is you, I want to say, don't hold back your gift. Jump in. Honor God with this part of your life. Contribute to the kingdom of God. Others of you, you have heterosexual desires that you're wanting to long, like, honor God with. I want to ask, say to you, be careful also not to just lean into any desire falling into lust. Honor God with your purity. Run from sexual impurity. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you self-control. If you're married, inspire one another toward Jesus. If you make marriage your idol, thinking it's going to fix all your problems, you will also be struggling. Marriage is not your Savior. God is your Savior. Surrender your desires to God and honor him with your life. Some of you here, you have same-sex desires, but you want to honor God as well. I want to remind you, be honest about those desires. God loves you. He already knows every part of who you are. Having those desires does not make you sinful. It's what you do with them. But also don't assume that just because you have those desires that they're going to lead you to a flourishing life. You too are called to surrender every desire to Jesus. And I want to remind you, you don't have to do that alone. In this community, that's part of why we're doing this. We love people of every background and we invite everyone to journey together in loving community to the cross of Jesus. Every single one of us needs to surrender every desire to him. You know, David Bennett was here with us a couple weeks ago. He, is, he was a gay activist, atheist, a vow to destroy Christianity, found Jesus, was transformed by him, and then he shared his story of navigating same-sex attraction in light of his faith in Jesus. And he said it this way, my view is that when a gay person becomes a Christian, they must not repress or indulge their erotic longings or base their identity on such desires. Rather, they need to remember that these longings originate from a more fundamental desire for God himself. Same-sex erotic desires are part of our fallen humanity. All human desire can be traced back to our desire for God, even if twisted by sin. What this means is whether you are straight, gay, married or single, God calls us all to nail every desire, every longing, every attraction to the cross of Jesus. Having desires contrary to the will of God doesn't make you an accident. It just makes you human. 
but the invitation is to trade everything in us to a God that can give you the thing that will actually complete you. He's the one that can lead us to a greater life and show the world that his spirit in you is stronger than the sin that often dominates us. I'd love for you to hear this story from somebody right here at Echo who's navigated these tensions throughout her life. Would you join me in welcoming Susan Jackson to the stage? Come on over, Susan. Thank you for being here with me. This is the first time Susan's sharing her story publicly like this, and it's a big deal. So thank you for doing that. Um, Susan, I know you've been with us for a couple years, and many here have even known you, but your journey began, you know, really young, this journey of figuring out how to navigate desires and all of that, and it had a lot to, you know, your faith journey had a lot of ups and downs throughout all of this. Can you start from the beginning? How did it start for you, and take us on a journey throughout your, your life? So, um, I was about in kindergarten when I realized that I was same-sex attracted. Um, my grandparents lived right down the street from a lesbian bar, and I remember as a kid hearing my grandparents and my parents talk about the kind of women that hung out there. They were gross, disgusting, and I knew that being a lesbian was unacceptable, so I just pushed down those feelings. We grew up in church, but I never really felt like I belonged there. Um, I never really got into it too much. I was in early high school or middle school when um, the youth group decided to take a trip to Alaska. They were going to do a mission trip to Alaska to teach vacation Bible school. And it was all guys going, but I really wanted to go. So I tried to convince one of my friends to go with me. And it was going to be over her 16th birthday, and her family was moving, and she just kept telling me no. But I am very persistent when I want something. So I convinced her to go. Unfortunately, we didn't make it. Our van had an accident, and she died on her 16th birthday. I carried a lot of guilt for that. And I was 15. I was coming to terms with the fact that I was same-sex attracted, and the church had sent us to sent me to counseling to try to to a therapist to try to deal with my feelings um, of my grief. And that therapist during that time, as we were talking, I had mentioned to her that I was coming to terms with the fact that I was gay. And she said, "Well, there's your problem. You're gay. God's punishing you." I pretty well figured right then and there there was no God because there was no way that God could make me and make me like this and then turn around and hate me. I was just a kid. And um, so I started to dive into alcohol, drugs, sex, anything I could. Um, I moved to Missouri, and uh, I just kept feeling this longing I, I, I would wander into a church every now and then because I just, there was something missing. And it was a very small town and everybody knew me. And every time I went into a church, nobody would speak to me. They would just look at me like, what are you doing here? You do not belong in church. I would talk to my mom and sisters every now and then and they would you know, bring up God. They were praying for me. I wanted none of that. I hated God. I hated Christians. Well, there was no such thing as a God. And you people pushing your beliefs on me, I wasn't having it. it all it did was make me angry. Um, I just became a mess, deep, deep in addictions. I moved back here to California. My family did an intervention for me, and I got sober. And in that time of getting sober, that longing came back. I knew there was something more, but it sure was not Christianity. I, um, I started looking into spiritualism, tarot cards, um, Buddhism, and um, <clears throat> in, a in AA, I got connected with a group of women that go to Maui every year, and I was out on the water with a bunch of whales swimming around me, and 
I met God. I have no idea what happened in that time. I've tried to think about it. I, I, I have no idea. I just, all of a sudden, in an instant, felt something came over me. Yeah, I, know, I remember you describing this to me the first time. Like they, they were singing around you in the water yes. for a long period of time, and it yeah. felt like a, like a divine moment in your life. Yeah, yeah so, so that opened your eye to God again, and then you came home. What happened then? <laughs> I came home and I told my sisters that I would um, give this echo thing a shot because they had, been they had been praying about me coming here. And I remember my sister Lorraine got very excited. And I said, don't get too excited. I'm still leaning toward Buddhism. And she said, no, you're not. Um, so I, I came here and it was a totally different experience than what I had experienced at mm. any other church. I really expected to come through these doors and either be told to leave mm -hmm. or at, at most you know, just judged looked. And um, I didn't get that. Everybody here was just so loving and kind and people everywhere greeting me. And the message from the stage was that we're all broken. The guy on stage even said he was broken. That was amazing to me. I didn't feel like I was so alone anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I, I, at that time, I pretty much, I knew that I wanted to be a part of this dream team. Yeah. Um, I wanted but, people to But before feel. you go to dream team, yeah. I mean, you came right around Easter time. Yes. Right? Yes. And you made a, a decision to follow Jesus. I think actually maybe the first time even you came back or something like that? I or was, um, I came back from Maui um, at the end of February, mm -hmm. and I served at that Easter egg hunt and was baptized on that Easter. So a matter of just about a month, yeah, God just took hold of my life. Amazing. Yeah. And then you started serving. And tell a little bit of why you, you began to serve even in the guest experience team. And, you know, you, you've been consistent for over two years now. You might not know this, by the way, about Susan, but she, she's like, when I come on campus here at North early in the morning on Sundays, she's always one of the first people in the building and she's already there brewing coffee for everybody, preparing the environment, the tables. Every detail matters to her because she wants people to experience what yeah. she experienced. Share a little bit about that. Yeah, um, you know, I just, I knew from that time that I didn't want anybody ever to feel the hurt mm -hmm. and the rejection that I felt. Jesus is love. Mm -hmm. God is love. And all you have to do is love him. And he takes care of the rest. Mm. Love him, surrender, and he takes care of everything. Yeah. So then you, you're here. You gave your life to Jesus. You were baptized. You're serving. You still have desires. Yes. So talk a little bit more about that. Like how did that go with the surrendering that part of your life to him? What, did that, what does that look like for you? So I was... Um, you know, even after I got baptized, yeah, I was still, I'm still same sex attracted. And I was, I, I would read my Bible and I would read the passages against homosexuality and I just didn't understand. And I was crying out to God, God, why? Why did you make me defective? You don't make mistakes. Why am I like this? And in one of those nights of tears, I heard him speak to me and he said, you are not defective. You are my child. Remember Paul. And um, what came to me was Paul, and he, was, he had the thorn in his side, and he asked God three times to remove that thorn in his side. And God answered him, my grace is always more than enough for you, and my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses, for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the power of Christ living in me. Mm. And that just, that gave me comfort mm. in knowing that, that God's always going to love me. And yeah. at that time, I surrendered myself 100% to him. I said, God, take my life. It is yours. Use me. Mm. You've shared with me how this part of that surrender was understanding that this, uh, there's a way to honor God as a celibate Christian uh, that has same-sex desire. And, you know, David Bennett shared this a lot, too, that there's a part of him when he was with us that, you know, um, 
sometimes people will feel sorry for that decision. They're like, oh, but you don't, whatever. He's like, no, no, no. There is a blessing and a joy with that surrender that is really significant and that gives us hope. Share a little bit about that because you had a very similar experience where God showed you, like, no, there's, there's a trade-off for this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like everybody, you know, I wanted to find the one, and I was struggling with that, especially in, because, like you said earlier today, society is, is very much about being marriage, and, um, and I was kind of struggling with being single, and God showed me a passage in Isaiah 56, 5, and um, he says, I will bestow within them my household both an honored place and an honored name. Even better than the honor that comes from having children, I will bestow upon them everlasting favor. You will never be forgotten. And he's talking, and in that verse, he's talking about the eunuchs and the barren women. And um, I just felt a lot of peace, and I feel honored. Yeah. Yeah, there is a promise. Yes. Right, that there is a blessing that comes to those that honor God in this part of their life, and even as a celibate Christian. And I want you to know, Susan, that your devotion to Jesus, your willingness to share your story, you're part of our community, it matters, it's significant, you're deeply loved here, and you've inspired us with your faithfulness, and we're just deeply grateful. Can we thank Susan together? Appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Now, as we end our time together, I want to remind you of a couple things as a community. Remember what she said that her sisters never gave up on her, that they kept praying and praying and praying, believing that God will change her heart. I also love the fact that it was love and hospitality that moved her heart toward Jesus. You know, the scriptures are really clear about this. He said, Paul goes on, even in our text, he says, if you, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly take that person to the path. What this means is that we don't thump people in the head with the Bible. We don't try to change behavior by forcing things. We don't guilt trip people into transformation. What we do is we acknowledge we're all broken. We all need Jesus. Come with me to the cross. Come with me to the one that can change us from the inside out. We don't need to try to change people through political means and through pressure and all this stuff. What we do is we take them to the one who can, the one who is able, the one who is supreme over all things. His name is Jesus. We all have desires that if we pursue them won't lead to a flourishing life. And the invitation Jesus gives us is to actually take those desires and surrender them to him. And the promise he gives us is that when we come to him, and we surrender desire, attraction, every part of who we are to him, that it's a great exchange, that his spirit comes to live inside of us when we surrender our lives at that cross, that he produces in us love, joy, peace, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Our lives begin to tell a bigger story, the story that God is the one that completes the human heart. I wonder what he's saying to you is your time to surrender today. I want to ask you to locate this little card that's on your seats or under your seat, wherever you are on campus today. If you're in the balcony, it might be on the balcony or those of you in the warehouse, just locate this card. We're going to create some space in all of our campuses today to search our hearts and to say, Holy Spirit, Make me more like Jesus. What is it that I've been holding back from you that I need to surrender or trust you with today? It might be trusting him with sexuality. It might be trusting him with desires of success or money. It might be a disordered desire for for greed, whatever it is for you. Maybe it is a longing and attraction, something that he's saying, "You, 
you've kind of kept that part of your life over there, but I, I want you to trust me with every part of your life. As you search your heart here in a minute, I want to ask you to write down on this piece of paper what that is that God's revealing to you. And then I'm going to ask you to move out of your seats as we begin the song. And you're going to notice there's crosses all over our campuses in every location today. And what we're going to do is we're going to physically nail these cards to the cross. And as we do that, this is going to be our prayer. It's going to be our way of saying, God, take all of it. Take every desire, every longing, every attraction, everything I ever want. And I'm going to come to the cross believing that you are better than all other things. So I trust you with that. Whenever you're ready to make that your prayer, nail that to that cross as your commitment today. Father, thank you that you're here. And Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you know how to search all of us. So we invite you right now to quicken in our thoughts the area of our life that needs to be nailed, surrendered, entrusted to you. And as we do this together now, as we leave our seats to physically demonstrate our commitment, meet us there. Seal these commitments. May it be the beginning of a life of freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you saved me from myself, yeah. Praise be to God, praise be to God, a new life I've been dealt. Never look back, I can't go back, I'm yours, yeah. I'll never look back, I can't go back, I'm yours. physically crucify them with Jesus. That imagery of recognizing what he has done for us, that every time you hear the nail get pounded in to recognize the freedom that it's no longer yours to carry. It has been given back to him. Would you join me in prayer over these moments? Lord, we just recognize that each and every person that came forward to say, I don't want to take this on my own. I want to give it back to you. I want you to be my partner. In my weakness, I am made strong, but I need you. So Jesus, would you take it? Would each and every one of the people that came forward experience a blessing and the power of your spirit moving through them in these moments and the moments that come afterwards? We ask that through our weakness, you would make this community strong, strong enough to see this region and this world changed by your love. We ask for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we celebrate all of the individuals that came down and nailed that to the cross? You can go ahead and have a seat. I love how we get to hear a powerful testimony of somebody right here in our midst, which seals and solidifies all of the dynamics for us as individuals. And I don't know where you are on your journey, but one of the things I know is that at the end of each and every one of our messages, there's always something that we feel like God is inviting us into. And that's why we make space as a community to do what we call checking in. So if you would, go ahead and pull out your devices again, head back to that digital program, and the top button there is the check-in button. As you fill out your information, you'll notice that down below there's a variety of decisions, and maybe for you today was the day you recognize that desire that you've been trying to fill can only be filled by the love of Jesus, and today is the day you want to follow Him or that you've been waiting to go public with your faith, and so you're going to choose to get baptized as a result of allowing that desire to be filled in Him. Maybe it's something different and you have a question or a prayer request, but no matter what it is, please fill out that check-in form so our team can come alongside of you in this journey that the Lord has you on. 
Yeah, and one of the things for our next step is um, we provide an opportunity, an event called First Wednesday. But in doing those First Wednesday events, we've noticed that we have encountered God in a bigger way at those nights. So we've changed the name from First Wednesday to Encounter Night. And we are so excited to have one coming up on May 1st at, here at North San Jose. So within the digital program, you can RSVP there. There's child care. It's an amazing night, another opportunity to encounter the love of Jesus in a whole other way through worship and in prayer. That's right. We would love for you to join us. Make sure you RSVP. And one of the other things that we sometimes have to nail to the cross is our uh, desire and our finances and the control on them. And that is why each and every week we have a moment where we step into the generosity and giving because Jesus gave himself for us. And here at Echo, we never do this out of guilt or shame. This is an invitation by God to say, I trust that with 90% of my income, and giving 10% of it to you. I can live and survive and probably do more because your blessing is on it. Jesus talked about money a lot when he walked on this earth. And one of the things he told his disciples in Matthew chapter 6 was, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths can eat them and thieves can break in and steal them. But store up your treasure in heaven so that way so many more would benefit. And so it's not bad to have things, but when we put and invest in the things that matter, Matter to God as a portion of what we have, there's more blessing upon those moments. And so that's why we invite you to join us in the journey of generosity. You'll notice right there on your digital program is a give button. You can click that give button, which will take you to our platform to set up your gift. We would love for you to join us today. Yes, and as you lean into this giving moment right now, one of the things that we, we love to do here at Echo is, is basically share with you where all your giving goes. And one of those areas are missions trips. And here, coming out of the North San Jose campus, our very own Pastor Ooh. Steven is going to Malawi along with the team. And he created a video for you all to take a look at what they'll be doing. Take a look. What's happening, North San Jose family? I am excited to talk to you about our partner in Malawi, Africa, Hope Endeavors. Hope Endeavors is an amazing organization that we support here as a part of the North San Jose campus. And they are doing some amazing work in a small village uh, in South Malawi, Africa. I wanna share with you a little bit about Hope Village. Hope Village is an orphan care center that is specifically designed to provide food, shelter, and an environment for kids that have lost their parents to the HIV AIDS epidemic, and they themselves also carry that disease. Now, Hope Village is a source of hope for their future. Although they've walked through so much in their life, now as a result of Hope Village, they have opportunities to live a long, full life as a result of the care that they are getting and we are supporting. Now, we have three Three opportunities for you today to get involved, to go above and beyond with our partner, Hope Endeavors. The first is that you can choose to actually sponsor one of the children that is living at Hope Village. It's a $40 a month sponsorship to be able to go out there and bless and provide all that they need. Beyond that, they also run a nursery school to actually impact the local kids in the surrounding villages by giving them access to education so that they can further their lives and their families. You can sponsor one of those kids for $10 a month. All the information is actually out in the lobby and you can grab one of our cards and start sponsoring them today. The second way that you can get involved is by supporting the team that's actually heading to Malawi with me at the beginning of June. One of those ways is we most of us drink coffee and we have coffee for a cause, which is an opportunity for you to buy a pound of coffee and all the additional profits are actually going to support the trip and the fun opportunities we have to bless kids as we're there in Africa. The third is that you can come and support and be a part of our Malawi banquet on Saturday, April 27th. Tickets are $50 a person.
person, there's gonna be a silent auction and a way for you to engage. Now, each and every time we give here at Echo, we have the opportunity to impact in Malawi as a result of our partnership. But what this is, is this is an above the normal opportunity to make a monthly impact by sponsoring a kid or choosing to then engage with what the team is gonna be doing in Malawi, Africa in just a few weeks. We hope that you will get involved and recognize you don't necessarily have to be on the ground to make a huge lasting impact in the lives of these kids. I'm obviously very passionate about the work that is going on there and would love for you all to get involved. So as you head out the doors into the lobby, you'll notice that there are three wood boards around that central pole. Each of those boards has different kids, whether or not they're the orphans or they're the ones that are in nursery school. As you walk around the boards, find the kid that makes the most sense for your family or that you have a connection with and actually grab that card. You can take it home and then when you're home, set up that monthly recurring gift, put them on your fridge, pray for them and then we'll be giving updates for everybody that signs up to sponsor a child with videos and interactions from our time in Malawi with them. If you want to buy coffee or sign up and buy a ticket for the banquet, our Malawi team, which Susan, who was up here sharing her story, is with me on that team, is out there selling coffee and tickets to the banquet. With all that being said, we'll see you guys next weekend for all the fun events. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks for joining us again today for Church Online. I hope you're encouraged by the message, by Susan's story, uh, and by the experience as a whole. I hope that God had something for you that he spoke to you about in your life. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, you're going to want to make sure to join us again because we have a powerful story we're going to be sharing. We have a special guest named Sunbird who's going to share his story about navigating what it meant for him to be a gender-fluid person and finding Jesus later on in life. Uh, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a powerful story. Make sure you check out the rest of the series if you haven't done so yet. Uh, it's been an incredible journey for us together. Make sure you join us. That's it. That wraps up our time together. Have a great rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you next week.